Uh, good afternoon, and uh, welcome again to the Adobe Technical Seminar Series. Uh, this afternoon, I'm delighted to uh, uh, be able to introduce my good friend, Alex Stepanov. Uh, we work together at AT&T Labs and uh, 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 had some interesting stories there. Uh, he's now at Compaq. Uh, earlier in his career, uh, he was uh, instrumental in the design of the standard template language and is going to be talking today about STL and its design principles. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Larry for inviting me. It's always very, very pleasant to talk to people. Just now you could hear me. Uh, it's always very pleasant to talk to people who do real software development. I'm not so fortunate. I do mergers and acquisitions and other amazing stuff. Uh, but um, what I will try to do today is not to teach you STL. It's a long thing to do. I don't think I could do it in a single presentation anyways. Uh, what I will try to explain is, first of all, why I did what I did, as it were. You know, what are the principles? What, what are the fundamental ideas from which some particular design decisions follow? Right? The intuitions behind, behind the thing. And then I will actually try to explain to you where I think the world should be going. What should happen with programming languages? I will try to outline a new programming language. I will try to, very briefly, and then again, one cannot do much in a one, one presentation. What should be done with software engineering? And then I'll end up sort of a, with an attempt to evaluate, uh, you know, how much of STL is a success, if, if any of it is a success. Uh, right, so this is the plan for the talk. I will um, start with uh, telling you a little bit of its history. And uh, if you look at this slide, uh, you will learn several things. First of all, you will learn that I'm not very young anymore, since it's, uh, you know, uh, started a long time ago. Uh, you could also derive some other useful uh, things, like Dave Massa is really a very close friend of mine, because as you see, we collaborated throughout time and time and time again. He's a professor at RPI, and he is my closest collaborator. Um, uh, it does give you some misleading information. You might decide that I had the luxury of working on something which I wanted uh, for 25 years. Uh, far, far be from, from that. I mean, nobody gets such, such a good break. Uh, and I had to do many other things while working on that, like writing device drivers and, you know, doing robotic motion work and doing all kinds of other things. Uh, which, which has no relation to, to, to this talk. Uh, but fundamentally, there, there were multiple attempts to do one thing, to try to organize software in some systematic, methodical way so that uh, you, could compose, you could compose things uh, together easily. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the, in 20th century, there is a very wrong idea of science uh, developed in popular culture. And Einstein, who was, of course, a great scientist, is partially responsible for that. The idea is that scientist is somebody who has long hair, never gets a haircut, uh, seldom washes, and discovers some wonderful, wonderful things uh, because of some inspiring breakthroughs. And science is actually uh, it's something you do on a regular basis. Uh, I think a much better paradigm for a scientist is somebody like Carl Linnaeus, who established modern modern uh, zoology. That is, you send people, you send your disciples all over the world to bring you examples of animals and other living species, and then you try methodically to classify them. Science is about classification. Science is not about grand inspirations. Fundamental of any science is classifying the the basic principles. So this is, this is sort of an important part of what I've, I'll be talking about today. So uh, and the very simple intuition, which I heard very, very long time ago, indeed 25 years ago, uh, was the intuition that somehow algorithms are associated 
with set of properties. And let me just tell you what was the intuition. It's, it's silly. I needed to give a presentation because I had an interview presentation about parallel computations. And I was looking for a fundamental insight just for this one talk. I was not looking for a major discovery. And then I suddenly realized that if I take a very simple operation, adding n numbers together, I could do it in parallel by adding first and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, and then adding results, what I now call parallel reduction. You could do it in parallel. And then I thought about it and I said, well, maybe I could use multiplication too. And I realized that multiplication could be done of n numbers exactly the same way. And so you could do max. So you could do mean. So what is in common between these operations? That I could use the same algorithm for reducing n elements together into one. And then I realized one very, very simple thing. The fact is that both plus and times and min and max are associative. That's why I could reorder the operations and do them in parallel. That is, I realized that algorithms are affiliated somehow with mathematical theories. Associativity is something which you actually learned at school, part of mathematics. So, well, and then it took very many years and wrong tries to try to use this intuition to organize things, to associate software components with theories, where theory is just a bunch of properties such as associativity, commutativity, and so on. So that, that was the start. And after that, you know, there were multiple tries. I mean, first try, uh, you know, I was, together with my friend Dave Massa and Deepak Kapoor, tried to develop a new programming language. You know, and Larry understands him, and we're all timers. We, we know that at this time frame, that's what you did. You developed a new programming language, and you made it functional. It is, uh, you know, because doing useful programming language was considered to be like not a good thing to do. So we did design very wonderful language in which you couldn't do anything remotely useful, but it was quite pretty. So uh, called tecton means creator or carpenter, both in, in Greek. Uh, so then through multiple, multiple ways going through Lisp again, at that time I was a great admirer of Lisp communities, including Larry, and learned quite a bit from them. Then I sort of, perchance, managed to do something in Ada. So I discovered what you could do with strong typing, and then step by step ended up working in C++. So the lesson is multiple languages, multiple tries. Most of the tries were total failures, at least in my opinion. Okay? Which is another sort of thing. You know, when you fail, try and try again. And you heard it before, it is true. At least that's what I discovered to, to, to be true. So um, then eventually STL was produced. Then eventually STL was expanded. All of you who use STL, I highly recommend that you do not use Microsoft STL. It is you know, beyond contempt. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they're recording me. Uh, well, so uh, download free and wonderful SGI STL, no charge. It's much better and has much more data structures and much better stuff than you find in most commercial implementations. There's the only plug, I, and I get no royalties. Trust me, there's no, no. Yes, it's very hard to get royalties on something which is free. Um, so let us, let us look at sort of what are the fundamental principles. And I, you know, it's hard to to list all of them, there may be more, but I think that these four are the ones which, which are orthogonal. That is, I could imagine doing something using the first but not the second, and so on, right? This is the, and the first one is of the most paramount importance is systematic organization of software components, right? The second one says that doing gen generic representation of algorithms. Yes, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it might not be good. First is always good. It's always good to try to organize your stuff in some systematic way because 
this is, this is the essence of what I claim of science, of trying to methodologically organize your knowledge base. Yeah? Number two, abstraction is very important, but doesn't always work. You know, I could imagine myself writing a library, doing it in a very non-generic way. And if I write a library for, you know, some physical, describing some physical phenomena, it could use one data type called double. It'd be a perfectly fine library. I mean, for doing whatever physicists do. But uh, first, so the first and second are very, very, Okay. Uh, first and second are quite, quite orthogonal, and so, and so on. So we will, we'll talk more about them. So, you know, just four, four principles. And the first principle is of great sort of how, how do you find them? Um, let me check whether mm, I forgot what I'm How do we find them? And uh, I could tell you how I found them. You know, you look at books. Most stuff in books is not usable because people publish stuff just to publish it. So you have to sort, you have to find things which are useful. You have to read, you know, many volumes and ignore most of it. You really don't want to put bubble sort into your library. It serves no purpose other than allow Knuth to write about 20 pages of detailed analysis of totally useless algorithm. It's not just my opinion. I mean, he starts this section of his book with a wonderful quotation. Bubble sort has nothing to recommend except for the catchy name. So why, if it is true, would you describe it? Well, nevertheless, he does, and he spends a lot of time analyzing it. And every book on algorithm, for some mysterious reason, follows the example of disguised bubble source. So you have to ignore stuff. A lot of stuff is there just because people published it, or, or you know, you ha but you have to read it. You have to go through books. The second source, and in some sense, in my opinion, marvelous source, are other libraries. Because these are some things which people did use before. Some, some arrangements which people found out to be useful before. And you could see borderings in STL. I mean, you know, I don't know how well you remember some STL functions, but very clear that things like accumulate reduction comes from APL. Right? So there is a lot of things borrowed from APL. There are lots of things borrowed, stolen, whatever, from Common Lisp. I mean, there, you know, I freely give credit because I did steal. I did take it from there. Right? There are things which clearly go back to small talk. I mean, STL is not small talk like library at all. But the notion, I mean, the idea of having sets and maps, these kind of data structures associated with data structures, which are not present in either APL or Lisp, you know, was suggested to me by, by small talk. So again, you try, you try to look at everywhere you could find things. And then real codes. Again, I proudly say that, you know, I read a lot of other people's code. In some sense, there is a generic algorithm hiding behind every while loop. Sort of, you know, if I had infinite amount of time, which I don't, I would go to, through all of your guys' code and replace every while loop with appropriate abstraction. We'll come to, to that. Because, you know, you're, you're attempting to do something. There, there's some algorithmic thing which needs to be extracted from there. And I could even point, let me give you a real example of something which was extracted from a code for a disk drive controller, a JSON find. I mean, it's not much. You know, in a sense, it's not a big function, but it is a function which I literally discovered while reading through somebody's, well, partially my code for, for, for disk drive controller. So, oh, this is a very interesting loop. You cannot do that with any other algorithm in STL. And it sort of fits very nicely. It is a nice generic algorithm. You could check what it is, a JSON find. Uh, and again, it comes, it comes from a real code. You have to look at real code. So, in great degree, from my point of view, the design of a generic library, if it is to be a useful library, 
is similar wildliness. Remember I said going and catching animals? That's what you have to do. You have to go catch the species of code and classify them. Find what, you know, what particular genus this code belongs to. You find a particular animal, you bring say, oh, that's a rabbit. Or this is a sequence. If, if you, if you, you know, I'm speaking metaphorically. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of this activity is a very mundane activity. This is why, you know, I, I never understand, you know, I, I have to meet occasionally with people who are doing so-called research in computer science. Uh, they say, well, I don't know, I don't have any ideas. Don't have to have any ideas. Go catch rabbits. Go look at people's code. Don't find what they do and try to, to abstract it. You know, the, there are so many things are out there. You know, STL covers tiny area. Again, one, you know, I'll be complaining later about it. So, but it, it is relatively small. It's probably the largest library of its kind. But it covers, it, it is just the beginning. I never intended to be the end of the activity. Well, okay, so how do you implement them? And that is a very difficult part. Because you see what you find in books, what you find in other libraries, is usually is not quite right. And here comes this notion of correctness which I'll try to illustrate. There are certain programs which compile some function could compile, runs, but it's incorrect fundamentally. It's metaphysically wrong. Okay? That is not, it's not that it does not do what it's supposed to do. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. I, I have a friend who used to run a compiler group at Borders. And once he submitted a bug against some OS guys, and they returned, they closed the bug without doing any change, re replying, works as coded. It's just <laughs> marvelous reply. I mean, it, it always does, doesn't it? Uh, so, and, uh, most pieces of code do what they specify to do. Unfortunately, specifications could be wrong, fundamentally wrong. Let me try to illustrate. And again, I'll do simple examples, but I hope I'll get the point across. The simplest task you could imagine is that you have a sequence of things and you want to find an element in the sequence which satisfies some predicate, some, some condition. What should it return? Well, you know, believe it or not, many books and even existing libraries say you should return this element. This is a wrong answer. Let's see why it is a wrong answer. It's not, I mean, I don't have any specifications, but I, I really believe that it's absolutely wrong because it does not allow this find to do what a really good find should do. First, you see, you cannot even write it because what if it's not in the sequence? What do you return? Well, there is a very simple answer. You return nil, says Larry. I use Larry as a you know, prototype list programmer. Yeah? Return nil. Then I have to have nil in every type, whatever I'm looking for. That is, I have to create this bottom value in every type just to return to find. But then even if I do that, it's practically pointless find. Because you see, very often, if I want to find something, I want to do something with it. Like, you know, find Larry and kill him. <laughs> right? So, to kill him, I have to know where he is in the sequence, not just to get a copy of Larry back. Killing copy of Larry is not what I want to do. I mean, this is a sequence of my friends, Larry just defended me. I want to zap him. That is, I need to get back some handle which would allow me to zap right. But even more significantly, I try to increment the third reason why it's totally pointless, that it's not just Larry whom I want to zap. I want to zap all the people who are unfriendly to me. That's the predicate. So after I find Larry, what do I do? I have to restart my find 
from some other, I mean, returning Larry is not good enough. I need two things. I need Larry's position, and then I need position from which I restart. You understand? So I could do it repeatedly. Find the next one till the sequence is exhausted. Just, that's what you typically do. You find first, you find second, you find, think about it. Right? So this shows you that we could look at the interfaces and see whether they do the right thing. And what does it mean, the right thing? The right thing that whether they return you the information which, which is sufficient. That is, there is the opposite principle of information hiding. The interface should give you all the useful information back so that you could do whatever you want to do later. It should give you so that you could zap him, you could increment his salary. This is a good thing. Uh, you could find the next guy and so on. Right? Let us, let's take another example to, to sort of illustrate the point. And, of course, you know, you say, well, but everybody would specify and find like that. A common list didn't. Let's like, look at another marvelous example, binary search, which neither APL, nor common list, nor small talk do have. Amazing stuff. People would have huge libraries constructed which would have sort, but no binary search. And you say, why would you ever want, I mean, you know, the main reason you sort things is to enable you to fast them, to find them fast, binary search. And then they don't give it to you. At least C library does, in a way, as we shall see in a second. So people often overlook things. This is why being consistent is important to look at all the things. So let us look at how binary search is usually specified. And I will give you the following three places. Knuth, Bentley Programming Perl, and uh, C, B search function. All of them do exactly the same thing. First, they find an element and return you its position, its index. It's always a number. Assume that what you want. So you say, well, I mean, is it always good? Well, it's not always good because Believe it or not, you might want to use your binary search, even with a linked list. You say, oh, that's ridiculous. No, it isn't, because list traversal is a very fast thing. Predicate could be a very, very slow thing. And if I could construct binary search that it doesn't traverse list too much, it does just n traversals, and find what I am looking for with log n steps, this is good. You should do it. Actually, you should. More importantly, if they do not find it, what do they return? They return minus one. Well, I mean, think about it. If you don't find Larry in the list of my friends, what do you want? I'm looking for Larry in the sorted list of my friends. I want to insert him there. And they're returning minus one. So what do I need to do right now? March back sequentially, find an insertion point? Minus one is the wrong thing. They lost the information. Right? They did something. They were computing for log n steps, searching for Larry. They didn't find him. But then they threw away the information. And that is bad. You have to save the information. You have to sort of return a place where Larry should be if he were there. Right? The insertion point for Larry. And then the second thing. If you think about it, there are two points where you could insert Larry, potentially. Let's assume that I could have multiple copies of him. I wish I could. He's a wonderful person. So uh, what, what would I do? I'll insert one Larry, another Larry, the third Larry, but I would want to sort of know where the first Larry is and where the last Larry is. The algorithm, if you think about any sorted sequence, there are two points determined by any value. The first place where this value is or should be, and let me talk STL, the point past the last place where it is or should be. It's always a range. There are two points. So you have to construct correct interface. Interface construction is of paramount importance. Unless you do so, things don't work. And Returning these two points, you do not lose information. Everything is preserved. Huh? 
Then you have to implement, and that requires work. I mean, I'm sure you know this part. You know, you have to, you have to write code. I do not believe in paper library design. Things on paper don't work. You have to implement, and then you discover many, many remarkable things. Like things which are supposed to work don't work, some algorithms which are supposed to be good are not good, not useful at all. So then you have validate and think about it. You know, I'm running ahead because, you know, what you know already that what I'm writing is genetic binary search, right? Or genetic find. The, the one which will work in all possible contexts. It's a non trivial task to validate it. What does it mean? Well, you see, I validate it against vector. I debug it with vectors. Does it mean that it will work with lists? No, it doesn't. Or I put some, you know, one type of element in a vector, works with it. Does it mean that it will work with any type of element? No, it doesn't. So it actually have to construct a rather elaborate methodology. And part of the sort of sad reality that when I left HP, a lot of material on generic validation and uh, measurement of code were just dumped. And then, you know, since I did not release them in public domain, I now didn't. attending Jason Bartel. Hello. Uh, so, in any case, uh, a lot of a lot of the stuff which you need to do is validation, and that includes measurement. You have to measure. Again, the difference between somebody who attempts to write a piece of code, you know, when you, you know, you just write it. You don't spend much time measuring. And don't tell me that you do. Most of you don't. Because, you know, I was writing application code. You don't have time. There are pressures to produce. This is the problem with sort of today's software engineering. You cannot afford to spend time measuring binary searches. Right? But if I try to produce a binary search, which millions of people will use, then I better measure it. Then I better measure it very, very carefully. I better create a measuring methodology. So part, part, of, the, part of the stuff is actually a lot and a lot of work for doing you know, routine, uninteresting, boring things. And measuring actually, again, on which architecture do you measure? Intel? RISCs? VLIW systems? Again, the, you say, oh, it's all the same. No, it isn't. Okay, which compilers do you use? So again, a lot of work for doing it is actually doing this cross crossing architectures, compilers, and a lot of that. It's it's a boring, it's work, you know, it's blood and sweat. I mean, it's not fun, uh, but it needs to be done. This is a part of this activity of creating usable, usable libraries. Yeah? So organizing components. So you already had a glimpse of it when we talked about binary search. Remember, we figured out that we need to find two points. So we would have one function which returns one point because you don't need the other one or the other side. Or you would have a function which will return both. STL actually has all three. Why? Because, you know, I'm not going to tell you which one you need. You know, depending on the application, you get all three. And STL itself inside uses all three because in different contexts you need all three. This is how, how you discover. But more importantly, you have to fill the gaps. You have to sort of look and say, well, there are these functions like sort, there is no binary search, yes? You know, or you could say there is a very nice notion of stable sort, stability. There is no unnecessary permutations, if you like. I mean, the equal elements preserve their original order. Then you start thinking, oh, and I have a thing called partition. Wouldn't the same attribute apply to it? Shouldn't you have stable partition? Because you have to spend a lot of time filling the gaps. It's like creating periodic table, if you like. Sort of see whether everything which you need to, to have is there. And then you sort of try to do this orthogonal thing, which in STL, is, you know, you have containers here, you have algorithms here, so, you know, it's systematically organized. And then you document. And again, if you look at um, SGI STL, it shows you that you know, there was some effort documenting things I and mean, describing for every component precisely what are the conditions, what is the complexity, what is the set of valid expressions, all of that. Undocumented software is waste. 
I mean, you know, nobody could use it. It's a liability for a company. I'll be talking about it later. Uh, huh? Okay. Now, the second, second principle. We have to write generic code. What does it mean? It means that you know, we have to make our algorithm to work in the most general setting possible. And that is very difficult. Fundamentally, here I describe a mechanical process. Take a code, replace actual parameters with formal parameters, write specs, and uh, derive requirements. But in reality, it's much, much harder. What you really need to figure, and that's where lots of time goes, you need to figure out what logicians called what is the set of intended models. Sounds very complicated, but it's very, very simple. That is, for every algorithm, you have to sort of spend time thinking what is the set of potential application of this code. And then you realize that, you know, there could be the same generic algorithm could be used in very different contexts. For example, you could use an algorithm which searches for a circular list by tracing list structure to find out what is the uh, periodicity of a random number generator. This appears to be entirely different algorithm. In reality, it is the same generic algorithm. Because if you want to find out an algorithm about single linked lists, whether they loop like that, where you look in Knuth is the section of random number generator. Knuth always does that. He puts something in a different context in the exercises. So uh, it is actually there. So you have to imagine this broad set of intended model and write, write, write an algorithm. And it could be a very long activity. I have a talk, which I actually wanted to give here, sort of this talk, where I spent an hour and a half describing a history, how through history one algorithm was abstracted. Euclid's algorithm, GCD, greatest common divisor. And this is quite amazing how, you know, see this one piece of code, if you could call it code, because we're talking, you know. And, uh, you know, it's very instructive because a lot of what happened with mathematics that is this precise thing called gradual development of abstraction. This is the power of modern mathematics comes from the fact that mathematicians discovered that the same theorem could work in multiple different contexts. So the same idea here. The same algorithm could work in different, often unthinkably different, like random numbers versus linked list contexts. Right? So um, whole part semantics. So th this is the third idea. And uh, here I need to talk, you know, the idea number two, generic programming, talks, ex explains to you how you deal with algorithms, how you make generic algorithms. This tries to explain the fundamental idea behind a stale notion of a data structure. And behind it lies a very, very simple intuition that data structure is a structure. Remember struct? So container is just a generalization of a struct. The reason we need containers is because structures are not flexible enough to do everything we want. You know, we could put an array into a struct. Yes, you can. But it's only a fixed size array. The reason we need vector is not because of anything, it's just because we cannot put a growing array inside a struct. Structs do not grow. But it's fundamentally the same semantics. Struct is a bunch of things put together, right? And the second intuition, more even primitive intuition than, than struct intuition, is sudden realization that, after all, Aristotle was right. Aristotle was always right, but in this particular case, I'm referring to the dictum which all of us believe which is false, because we took some course in set theory. Aristotle believed that whole is always bigger than a part. He was right, it is so. I mean, in the real world, look around yourself. I'm bigger than my leg, leg is my part. It's because we are confused with all these infinite sets, we, we decided that it's not true anymore. But it's true with any 
conceivable object. There is this whole part relation, which is a marvelous relation which describes reality. And that is what STL uses. It does assume that two things never intersect. Think about it. Two things in the world never intersect. Two chairs never intersect. Larry and I don't intersect. Not really. I mean, we, we meet, but we don't intersect. We don't share legs, fortunately. Uh, and uh, we, are, we, we possess separate existence. You know, however much, you know, I love Larry. If, <laughs> if he dies, and I do, if, if he dies, I'm going to survive. I'm a separate entity. So this is what STL uses. It uses these very, very basic rules determining what objects are. The ontology is that there is this non-intersecting object. If an object dies, all its parts die. When an object is created, constructed, all of its parts are constructed. And it also assumes a very, very fundamental evaluation, which sort of should have been in, in, in uh, C, not even in C++, but it isn't. It assumes that equality is always defined. And if you think about it, it's, it's a great sort of irony that C defines equality on all building types, right? You could say equal, equal. But it doesn't define equality for structs. And if you knew the reason, you would laugh. Okay, I'll tell you the reason. Dennis Ritchie thought about it, said, well, you know, I don't want sometimes, I want to pass structs without passing along the padding. Therefore, if I do bitwise comparison for equality, the thing which I just pass to a function is not going to be equal to the original. Now, I mean, he didn't have time to think about that you have to do recursive equality by parts and ignore the padding. Therefore, we got a very, very major <coughs> hole in the type system of C and therefore C++. Because equality is very, very fundamental because that's the operation which defines the semantics of constructors, of assignment, of things like that. What does it mean that you construct an object from some other object? Construct an equal object, object with equal parts. What does it mean that, you know, and things like that. It's very, very simple, but unfortunately not in the language. Um, okay? And then finally, and I'm sure you heard of them, there are things called iterators. And again, it was, you know, it took me many years to realize that addresses are good. That after all, von Neumann was not an idiot when he invented von Neumann computer. That it's actually very, very fundamental primitive which allows us to describe our computations. And I don't mean machine addresses. People get confused. There are multiple kinds of addresses. URL is a perfect kind of an address, right? So, and without, without these addresses, we couldn't do much. The idea of functional programming is not really realistic because if you attempt even to specify this operation, remember in the beginning I say parallel reduction, Remember how I described it? First and second, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, add them together. I used addresses. To describe even a parallel iteration, you need to have some way to refer to these pieces of data. That is, you have to have addresses, ability to refer to data through some handle. And uh, what do, do, do these iterators do? First, they give you fast access to the data. What do I mean by fast? I just told you that URL is a perfectly good example of an iterator. So it's not as fast as reading things from memory. But I actually could precisely define what it means. It gives you fast access means that it gives you as fast an access to this data as could be given. For example, if I give you a bunch of words in my document, which will uniquely find it through a Google search. That is not an iterator, because there is a faster way of finding. Give me URL. Okay? Finding me an index and a position in the beginning of a list is not an iterator, because there is much faster way. Give me a pointer to the node. 
This is, it is the fastest handle available for a given data structure, if you see what I'm trying. I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily fast. The data structure could reside on disk. But what it means that it's as fast as this piece of data could be reached. Then, the second premise is that there is a fast equality. Think about it. I want my find to work. Jumping back. And find does, what does it do? It looks at the data, it compares two iterators for the end, and then it assumes fast traversal. Find should be linear time. There should not be any hidden costs. Basically, what I'm saying is that a legitimate iterator is an iterator which will allow me to, to use generic find so that you don't lose any efficiency compared with the handwritten other way of finding things. This is a little subtle, but I hope I'm getting across because it's, it's important. So fast does not mean fast in terms of nanosecond. It means as fast as could be done for a given data structure. Huh? Iterator categories. I do assume that, do you guys know about iterators? Okay, so iterators are these theories, sets of requirements which tells you this thing could be iterated just forward or forward and backward or in random. It took me quite a while to figure out the semantics of input iterator because it's tricky. You see, because you know, we know one directional algorithm and we know two directional alg algorithm. What is input iterator? And it was, you know, I remember the day when I suddenly realized, and it was just you kind know, of wonderful, wonderful light. It's a single pass algorithm. There are some data on which you could look only once. Because you look, and if you move to the next one, it's gone. I mean, something which comes on the wire. I mean, there are multiple particular examples, but it's the weakest kind of iteration possible in some, some sense. That, that was very nice. And the important thing is this yellow stuff at the bottom. Because, of course, it's not an STL. And it could have been there, it should have been there, but it isn't. Multiple reasons. There, you know, I never got to a point of working in that two-dimensional data structure. Of course, two-dimensional iterators are useful even for a single dimensional data structure. Let me give you an example. And, you know, do you know what DEC is? How many of you know how STL DEC works? Okay. DEC is a sequence which is represented by chunks, and then there is some indexing which allows you fast random access. The problem is that if you use regular iterator, it has to go fairly sluggish because you have to check whether you hit the end of the chunk on every plus plus, right? And then jump. However, imagine if we had an iterator from which you could get the next stride. Like, you know, I come here and then it gets me a pair of iterators which are much faster than this iterator, which will go in this next buffer. Then I could rewrite my find and all other algorithms for this particular thing as a nested loop. Think about it. It's fairly tricky. But it could speed up even certain kind of single dimensional data structures. That's the point. Another example would be cache, cache lines. You know, if you could have iterators which were sensitive to cache lines, you could actually sort of copy, could do prefetching and sort of doing, doing things faster. Which is fundamentally thing is one dimensional, but the cache lines give you another dimension, right? Now, okay, let us look at C++. Now I'm going to say a lot of bad things about C++. Do not misunderstand them. First of all, uh, there is, it's absolutely true that Bjarne Strustup is a great guy, great man, great computer scientist, and he's my friend too. So I don't want to say bad things about him. But there are some limitations in C++, in particular in the context of doing STL. So this is not intended as a criticism of C++. 
If you like, it is a criticism of STL because STL is not perfect precisely because it's expressed in, in inappropriate language, language which does not allow you to do things. Okay? Think about one problem with C++. Right now, you know, everybody, I mean, I do remember a long time ago, there was only one correct way in programming in C++, it was object orientation. Some of you might have remembered those old days. Then things changed, and, you know, changed because of me. I, you know, I'm not that humble, I will say, you know, you know, I did it, there was another way, generic programming. So people started giving talks saying C++ is a multi-paradigm language. There are two mechanisms which attempt to do one thing, which allow us to produce reusable abstract components. One is object orientation, another one is generic programming. They try to do the same thing. Why do we have two mechanisms? Well, because both of what well, the answer is very simple, because both of them are actually quite broken. The next slide. So what is good and bad about, and when I mean object orientation, I don't mean some abstract object orientation. I mean C++ Java style object orientation. You know, inheritance virtual functions, not because you cannot argue in abstract. Okay? So C++ object orientation does a good thing. It separates interface from implementation. You could describe abstract class. You know about abstract classes. And then, you know, just use them and things should work properly if you preserve the semantics of the operation, all of that. And you could have either late or potentially if you have a good compiler early binding. Compiler could resolve dispatch at compile time. They don't. But one day they might. Keep hoping. But usually it is slow. Why? Because you have, imagine that if every time we do plus plus, we have to go through V table to a pointer, we have a function call. Instead of doing one assembly operation, which is actually scheduled in parallel with other operation, it's very clear which one wins. But all of that slowness is of no importance. The fundamental limitation of object orientation is that it does not allow you to express enormous amount of things. What I claim it does not allow you to express most things. Why? Because if you attempt to describe something, you have to create it. Remember how inheritance works? What is inheritance? Something which takes a bunch of signatures, function signatures, and modifies them. How does it modify them? It modifies the first argument of every signature. It is you have to have a variance in your thing on only the first argument. So, first of all, you have to, you have, to have variance only on one type, not two. Second, you have to have variance only on one type in the first position. That's how it works. It wouldn't work. You cannot implement, uh, you know, some of you might know, I mean, my canonical example, you cannot implement max. Try to come up with the object oriented max. It doesn't work. Because if you take signature, what is signature of max? T cross T into T, right? Takes two things of the same type, return the thing of the same type. We do inheritance. What signature do we get? T prime cross T goes into T. Only the first position changed. It doesn't work. It just doesn't. Not because, you know, I'm evil. I, don't, I mean, it's fundamentally limited. Yes? And you could do, people say, oh, you could use delegation. No, you cannot. Nothing works. I mean, say, well, but you don't need functions with two arguments. Well, let me tell you, that is just a lie. You know, you do. Plus is a function with two arguments. Times is a function with two arguments. I mean, there are all the things which we use are functions with two arguments. It's common. It's normal. It's all right. The entire world is built except push and pop for Windows systems. That's only cases where they work. Because one argument and void return type. Right? So there is this fundamental limitation with expressibility. Nothing we can do about it. It's just there. Well, I told you bad things about object oriented. Now I'll prove you that I'm fair. Let me tell you about generic programming. Okay, what, what, what is good about it? Well, the good thing about it 
in some sense. It's the bottom thing. You could do anything. You really could. But at what cost? The cost is rather terrible. Why? Okay, the simplest example, you know, do you believe me that I know STL? Is it, I, I think it's sort of self-evident that I do, right? My son, who is a junior at UC Santa Cruz, was taking a C++ course. And he needed to do some STL five-line program. Comes to me, he couldn't do something. I said, no problem, I sit down, I type it, I compile it with his compiler, and I run away in horror. Why? I get five pages of error messages. Right? I didn't know what to do. I say, okay, it's your class. Go away. Bye. <laughs> right? I'm not paid to, do, to read through five pages of his error messages. Does it happen to you? Well, of course it does. It's awful. Why does it happen? So the fundamental, fundamental thing is that there is no specification of the interface. Okay? When I say that something is an iterator, it's just a word. You know, when we will look in a second, and I'll give you an example. But there is no, I mean, things like iterators, they specify it in the standard, but language knows nothing about them. It's just the name of a formal parameter. They have no semantics. They have semantics in my mind. Hopefully they have semantics in your mind. They don't have semantics in the compiler. Right? Early binding only. Is it good? No, not necessarily. Sometimes late binding is a good thing. It's a great thing to do. And why couldn't I have late binding with template? I should be able to. Of course, it couldn't be done because the compiler has to massage, you know, it's basically source, source expansion. Yeah? Could be very fast. Again, I have to mention something called abstraction penalty. Uh, I spent years of my life exterminating it. You know, apparently even trivial things cannot be done right by the compilers. If you take an int and put it in one structure, suddenly it becomes a slow int. You say, why? Well, because. So right now it's better, but it took five years to get to the point, and you, you cannot imagine how much blood on my part to, to get abstraction penalty down to, to where it is. Uh, okay. So let's look. Let's look at a piece of code. This is real code. It actually does work. It is written in C++. In describe reduction, not parallel reduction, simple reduction, you start with one element, add them together, and this is actually even good one. It sort of uses identity elements because it says that if a sequence is empty, what do you return? You return identity elements of the operation. So if you do add zero elements together, you have to return zero. If you multiply zero elements together, what do you return? One, the identity of type. It's a standard, nice mathematical convention which allows you to do many things. It's a wonderful piece of code. It compiles, it runs, it works. Of course, it's very ugly. It has this type name, iterator, traits, input, iterator, colon, colon, value type. And, you know, I, I cannot defend that. I mean, it is an abomination. Uh, no way you could, could, you could write a different. There is one fundamental problem with it. If you compile that, you don't know whether it's right or wrong. No. Ah. Sorry, I, I did something terrible. I clicked twice. Don't read it. Larry? Okay, thank you. Okay, let's assume I wrote this. This has a bug, and I'm not going to ask you to find a bug. I'll show you where the bug is. The bug is here. Do you see this operation? Operation? Less than? It's not defined for input iterators. It's just not defined. I mean, you cannot look at two pointers, say, in a linked list, figure out which one is great. I mean, just, I don't know how to do it. Nobody does. So it's not defined. Will it compile? Of course it will compile. Will it debug? Yeah. For as long as I am debugging it with random access iterators, it will work just fine. You know, if I pass pointers, it works. It's defined for pointers. So for 10 years, it works. On the 11th year, somebody decides to use it. 
this is a simple example, but, but true, it happens all the time. Somebody decides to use it on a linked list. Finally, somebody tries. Yeah? And what happens? He gets error messages he will never understand. Because he's using reduction, which he knows is a well-written component that has been used for 10 years, on a linked list, a well-written component, been used for 10 years, and then he gets error messages which basically say that something or other is not defined on some nodes. This is the error message which you will get. Because they, you know, it will attempt to look at pointers to nodes, and there is no less, I mean, that is, he will get error messages referred, referring to objects of which he has no awareness. These are internal STL objects. Right? Why? Because input iterator is nowhere defined. It's just a formal parameter here. I say that it takes input iterator, but input iterator is just a word. I could have said foo, and it would be the same. Of course, there are requirements for input iterator, but they're on paper. Right? So, what, what do we need? Sorry, I'm right now getting... We have to define it. I mean, we, you know, the entire STL is built on things like input iterator, random access iterator, container, binary iteration. It deals with things called concepts. Things which, with certain, you know, set of signatures on which certain operations are valid, possessing certain properties. Concepts are not definable in C++. Oh, they're not also definable in Java, ML, Ada95, Common Lisp, Perl. Okay, you could add any language. I do not know a language which allows you to define them. Okay? And they are of fundamental importance because they actually correspond to something which mathematicians discovered a long time ago, things known as theory. What is a group? Some of you might have had a course in abstract algebra. It is a concept. You know, it's, it's an abstract entity. It's not a class. It's, it's a concept. It's very abstract. And this is what STL deals with. Things like groups, vector spaces, you know, stuff like that. And we have no way to do it. Why not? Because concept requires multiple types. You see, what this is a concept description of an input iterator. This is a new language. It will not compile. Don't try it. It will not compile. So, even with Microsoft. Uh, well, especially with Microsoft. Uh, so, first I'm defining something, default, constructible, assignable, semi-regular, which should be defined some other place. But then what I say, that input iterator is regular, incrementable thing, which means a thing which has assignment, construction, equality, and plus plus. These are two things. And this is inheritance. You see, inheritance done correctly is a wonderful thing. There's nothing wrong with inheritance. It's just inheritance in C++ and Java. That's another story. Oh, uh, I'm very sorry. I thought it was a pointer. So what does, it, what does it contain? It contains pointers to type. It has types. This is a concept of iterator. It's not just a bunch of signatures. It's a collection of types affiliated with iterator type. Right? This is input iterator. Here's a value type, something which dereferencing will return. You see value type. And it has distance type something which actually does not even appear in the signatures, but which we need in specifying the semantics of plus plus. Right? The longest, the type which encodes the longest sequence of plus pluses possible for a given type. Yeah? Uh, so what a concept is, simply speaking, it is like C++ class, except you have not just virtual functions, but virtual types. Very, very simple. From iterator, you could get a type descriptor of its 
value type or from its distance type, right? So we expand, I mean, if going down to, let's attempt to implement this language, we want to extend our V tables with type descriptors. And for every type descriptor, we specify to which concept it belongs in turn. We say that value type has to be a semi-regular type. It has to be constructible, otherwise it wouldn't work. And distance type has to be an integer of some kind. It is an integral type. This is another concept here. Yes? So, and then let us see how nice and beautiful becomes our reduction. Because now we don't need to say template. Any function written in terms of concepts is a template by definition. I mean, it's a generic function. It's not a template anymore. Right? What we need, of course, to deal with is the following interesting fact. We need to assure that value type of input iterator coincides with an argument type of the binary iteration. Otherwise, there will be type mismatch. But if we do that, these things, this signature, you don't even need the code. The signature by itself fully specifies the requirements for this generic function. That is, it could deal, you know, you could have late binding, you could do all kinds of marvelous things. Okay, this is another example of merge you know, shows you that you could have multiple, you, you, you could have input iterator first kind and input iterator of a second kind. This is the same concept, but potentially two different instances of the same concept. This is why I just gave this example, okay? So virtual table for input iterator will include value type, distance type, type of the iterator itself. You have to include your own type into the V table. Otherwise, you couldn't handle the types of other arguments of, you know, your ar argument T in position other than the first. And then you have to have copy constructor in the V table, which of course no C++, no Java would. Uh, default constructor, destructor you could. But, you know, you have to have the full thing so that you could really assemble the entire thing either at compile or runtime, whichever way you please, and it's not particularly difficult to, to do. And if we do that, if we unify these two things, we could do wonderful things. We could have pointers to concepts. We could have, you know, late binding, you know, and generic programming combined. You know, it's all, all kind of beautiful things. Unfortunately, we do not have a language like that. Okay, why, why not? You know, maybe in the last three minutes that I have left, I will attempt to, to answer, answer. How much time is, is left? One more. It is 4.35. We still got to five. Oh, so I have lots of time. Okay, good. Uh, now I'm going, you see, this sort of attempt to describe a new language in five minutes is tricky. Now I will try to describe a revolution in software which would be nice to have. And uh, in some sense, and you know, you're a working programmer, you should know that. We're in, not in industrial age. We're not even in craftsman age. We sit there, you know, all by ourselves, you know, writing code, which we ourselves do not understand after two years at least. I, I do not understand my own code. If it's, I mean, STL code I do, but application code which I wrote, I don't. Because, I mean, it's incomprehensible when I look at it, you know. Uh, uh, it's hard to understand. You know, nobody, I mean, of course we have job security because if they fire us, you know, they're stuck. Uh, but couldn't it be done? And the vision I'm describing is not very original. It was, it was described by Doug McElroy in 1968. And, of course, it's not here because somehow things are not quite working. So what was his idea? That you have catalogs, that you assemble software the same way you assemble hardware. I mean, hardware is industrialized. If you go to your boss and say that you want to design a new processor, because it would be nice for the next release of Acrobat to have this instruction, you know what will happen to you, right? But in software, if you say you want to write 20 more functions, nothing happens to you. The boss says, good, more functions, the better. 
I'm not making it up. I mean, your productivity is usually measured. You know, the next time there is this review, whatever performance review, you have performance reviews. Huh? Your boss will tell some other boss that my guy wrote 77,000 lines of code. Right? And instead of firing you on the spot for doing that, as they should, <laughs> they actually give you a big raise. I mean, it's, it's tragic, but true. Huh? So we have to change I mean, the thing somehow, if we are to succeed, if we get out of the mess we are in. And we are, what happened is like 10 years ago, people, or 20 years ago, people realized that software development was in a state of mess. And then something happened. Nobody's talking about it. We got used to it. It's not that it's any better. It's awful. You know, I'm a programmer. I mean, not anymore, sadly. But, you know, this is my job. This is what I know how to do. It is in a state of mess. You know, I, I looked at development organizations. I've been in development organizations. It's just awful. I mean, it's, it's amazing that things work. And of course, Microsoft things don't work because you know, they have these billions of lines of code and everybody gets a raise. And it cannot possibly work. So if you have catalogs where everything is well described, measured, you have curves which show you how performance changes, the same as, do you remember catalogs, hardware catalogs of phone? That's what we want. And then people should be divided. And I'm not trying, this is not a class distinction. I'm not saying that component engineers are better, smarter, or anything than system engineers. It's just a different skill. Most people find component work extremely boring. Because you sit there and you measure and you tweak and you, I mean, you do this, I mean, it's, it is boring. You know, you know I spent years doing it, so I know how boring it is. There is this great insight you get once a year, but most of it is routine, boring thing. But then you produce these algorithmic data structures which people could use. And then people who want to produce Adobe Acrobat should never write splay trees or linked trees. Why? It's not their job. They have to think about the, what Adobe Acrobat is doing, which is not data structures. It's actually the semantics of the application. It's a different activity. It's not, I mean, you know, it's not particularly revolutionary, but it's not there yet. It's just, you know, it's just not there. And could we get there? There are grave, grave difficulties. There always are. You know, for any, any change, and we're talking dramatic change. It's not just two people together say, let's change the way we're behaving. And we're talking massive organizations, which operate as any organization should in a very conservative way. I mean, you know, the... You couldn't change the way things are done. So what is not understood by most software development organizations, code is a liability. The more code you have, the more money you have to spend on it. Code, even written code, is a money drain forever. Because you couldn't leave code alone. It rots. I don't know how, <laughs> but it does. You have to have... For every so many lines of code, you have to have this guy who knows it. I remember, do you remember Tirov? Yeah. There was this guy, Joe Osana, who wrote it at Bell Labs, and then he died. And there was like crisis because he, I mean, you know, it's a sad thing, but you know, he dies and there's Tirov and nobody could figure out what it does. There was another guy you might have heard, Brian Kernighan, right? He wrote C book with, with Dennis Tritchie, yeah? And uh, Brian, the hero, I mean, he read Tirov code, but if any of you look at Tirov code, and you'll understand what a hero he is. It's uh, totally incomprehensible. He's one person in the world who knows it right now. There's one dead person who knows it. He's in heaven. It's Joe Sanna. And there's one live person, Brian Kernighan. He's at Princeton. That's it. And for like 20 years, every bug which will go, it will promulgate through all these chains of development organizations, then find its way to research to Brian, because this is one guy who could fix bugs and tear off. It's just like that. And I'm sure you're not surprised. This is, I mean, I've seen it, you know, time and time again in different contexts. There is this marvelous piece of code. Nobody could figure out what it did, but there is this guy who left, and we have to call him, and maybe we hire him as a consultant. He will come. Sounds familiar, yes? All right. So code is a liability. There should be tax for code you introduce. 
you write, that is, you write 77,000. Your department is charged 77 million, whatever. I mean, because the organization has to maintain it. We could, again, we could tweak. I'm trying to simplify things, but I'm actually not joking. There has to be economic mechanisms which change organizational behavior. Otherwise, there will be more and more code, and more code you write, bigger raises you get, and you know, why should you use STL or any other libraries, or why should you have a department producing components in your organization? It's, you know, and in any given moment, of course, it's faster today not to do it. Because you don't need to retrain, you don't need to relearn, you don't need to reorganize. But long-term thing is getting, again, look at the situation with Microsoft. I mean, they really cannot handle their own code base. It's very clear to me. I, I use them daily, and you know, it's highly unstable. It crashes. And we say, oh, it's because they're stupid. It's not the only reason. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's, it's also because nobody, even, even if they manage to hire smart people, what do you do with three billion lines of code? Written just, you know, while loops. And let me tell you, there is a fundamental difference every time you write while loop. You create this huge potential for bugs. For I do not understand while loops. I mean, they're complicated. In straight line code, maybe I could read if it's your straight line code. If it's your while loops, I was forgetting even go tos. You know, if you have iterations, variables, this, that, it's just too hard. But it's, it's very, very difficult. So, continuous professional education. So it requires a different economic model. And it's hard. This is, I'm just explaining why it's not happening. Because industry, it's not, I mean, most managers, deep at heart, of course they would like it happening. But it's just hard. The government, who pays for binary search? You say, oh, well, who does? You know, on, on this one case, case of STL, I swindle HP. You know, I was a manager, and I signed the release form. So the code went into the public domain. So all the world could benefit from HP investment. Well, it was approved by somebody, but you need two levels of signature. So, but Dan Fishman. He's not with HP anymore either. So uh, th there are, you know, there, there are profound problems there. Who pays for the development of fundamental data search? No company seems to be interested because you cannot have proprietary data structure. Proprietary Adobe linked list would be an abomination. Because Adobe shares the labor pool. You want it's like, you know, you really need shared base. It's very hard. So government needs to do something. I mean, again, I know that nowadays everybody says government is bad. No, government is good. I mean, it produces roads and education and other good things. And standards. That's where standards come from. We need standards. Government has to be involved. Sadly enough, for many reasons, government tried. I actually have to tell you a sad story. Is that a few years back, five years back, government allocated of the order not of the order, exactly $50 million for the production of low-level software components, STL class. You haven't seen any of them because all of them went to some advanced people who worked on memoization of factorial and other important things. Uh, some of you might know what it means. Uh, well, uh, Fibonacci, memoization of Fibonacci numbers, pardon me. Uh, you know, some totally irrelevant and, you know, idiotic things. So it's very hard to create. I mean, the infrastructure does not exist. And academia, well, let me tell you, if you think industry is conservative, or government is conservative, you know nothing. The most conservative part of this triad is, of course, academia. Because, you know, there are these courses, they teach data structure. They are going to teach you bubble sort. They do. I, I mean, yesterday, I, I had like three-hour conversation with the most famous data structure guy there is. Bob Tarjan, I mean, well, with the second most famous, two in the world. And you think, uh, he teaches bubble sort. When it, I mean, they teach bubble sort. Why? Because that's what is done, right? And as a matter of fact, I claim that they shouldn't even teach quick sort. It's done. 
I learned it, I implemented it, it's good enough there. Well, very few people could improve it. Right? It's actually quite fast, and believe it or not, it's the only quick, quick sort implementation in the world which is guaranteed n log n, not average n log n, well, unless you use Microsoft. <laughs> I mean, they, they remove features from the code because they couldn't understand what it does. <laughs> uh, uh, not making it up. Uh, quick sort in STL is guaranteed n log n. For those of you, you can stay after talking less than have a dozen. But you know, the, they, you know, they have textbooks, they routine. It's very hard because if we want to educate programmers, we actually have to educate very few people in intricacies of implementing data structures and quick sort. We don't need many. We need very few. How many? Seven, I don't know. Right? <laughs> few. And then we need to educate the rest of how to navigate through catalogs, how to assemble, how to find out appropriate parts, right? So it's a big, big job. So changing the world is very hard. So should we despair? No, not necessarily. You know, maybe it will happen. Okay, so one of the things, you know, I'm giving this talk, maybe one of you eventually will do something and another one, and then, you know. It cannot be done by one person for sure. Right? But I do hope that, that we will move our profession into something more regular that will become more like even medical doctors. It's amazing how much more professional they are compared with us. I mean, they have these procedures and protocols. I mean, amazingly, amazing stuff. You know, I had, unfortunately, I had a lot of experience with doctors. Uh, so, okay. Sort of a conclusion. Is STL successful? This is self-assessment, but I'm, you know, this is not a pitch in a sense. I'll tell you both good and bad things. There are more bad things than good things. There are millions of copies out. This is no question about it. I don't know why, but I mean, you know, there are millions of downloads, you know, every compiler has it. Everybody ships it. Some people ship good version like IBM. Which, uh, IBM ships SGI version, free one. You know, uh, Microsoft bites uh, its version and whatever. Uh, but they ship it. Sun has it. Even HP eventually decided to ship it. It was the last. <laughs> By the way, anybody could figure out where they got theirs. You probably, no, not Microsoft. No, no, no. Rogue Wave. They bought STL from Rogue Wave. Do you know what was the difference between? original HP STL and Rogue Wave STL, they ran it through a pretty printer. <laughs> the line count was totally off, right? Nothing, no changes. HP would not ship the code which was developed by researchers. They had to buy exactly the same code for, I know how much money you don't want, you will be very upset and not sleep night. <laughs> if I tell you how much they paid. Right? And this is typical, by the way. Uh, you know, this is not particularly surprising. SGI hired me to develop something along STL lines. The same day they hired me, they signed a deal with Rogue Wave. They never, fortunately, I convinced them not to ship Rogue Wave code. So at least they, they, they have a much, much, much better version. So everybody ships it. It doesn't work. Some of them good, some of them less good. But I mean, you know, one could learn right now. There are courses. There are people at Stanford who teach. I mean, you know, you could actually learn it. And every so often I meet somebody, you know, I don't know, you know, on Custer Street, somebody comes and says, by the way, you know, you Alex Stanford? Yes, I say, I'm using STL. And he starts telling me how, it, you know, it's amazing how well some people understand the concepts. These are anecdotal. I have no, I mean, you know, working on cast and talking to programmers is not a statistically significant thing. But, you know, I had amazing examples of, you know, just some, some people, namely whom I do not know, telling me profound things. They sort of extended it in very nice way, things like that. But, again, talking about extension. What was the whole point about STL? It is an extensible framework, right? You could add your algorithms, you could add your data structures, it grows easily. Literally, it's very easy to extend. Almost no extensions. That is, all the 
serious extensions were done by my group at SGI. Right? The, the one, again, sort of, I expected a flood of new data structures. It's not happening. Why? Because it's work, and I, and I don't know. It's not happening. There are some good extensions done outside of sort of my immediate crowd, my, my personal friends. Uh, for example, there is a nice, very nice group at Indiana who produced two nice libraries. Uh, there just came a book called Boost Graph Library, which is a very nice attempt to bring generic programming into graph algorithms. And they also have a thing called MTL, Matrix Comfort Library. Uh, I have some minor criticism of both of them, but marvelous piece of work. I, I'm very pleased. Very slow. Right? No language progress at all. You know, we still live with these terrible error messages, inability. Sort of STL gets to C++ by the skin of one's teeth. It's, it's really sort of not what the language was designed for. No language prog progress. Nobody, we get to a point where nobody wants to fund language activity. This is just true. Okay? Why? I do not know. Because I remember good old times, at least Larry and I remember good old times, when everybody could design their own language and there were lots. No. Right? And it's not hard. You see? I'm not talking about just let's, let's reinvent everything. Let's just unify two abstraction mechanisms. And very little effect on software engineering. What I mean by that is not, there, is, there are people who use STL efficiently, but the process hasn't changed. In the same organization, there will be one guy trying to use and extend STL, and there will be another guy rolling his own unreadable code and being considered a good programmer. I mean, it's, it's true. Right? By the way, it's not, I mean, I'm just saying that this is not an attempt to say you have to use STL. I'm just saying that the progress in software engineering, unfortunately, is minuscule. So that's, that's, that's where the, the state of it is. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Does anyone have questions? Yeah, good. Alex, I'm a neophyte about STL, but I know enough to be dangerous. And um, I also know even a little bit less about another uh, programming paradigm called intentional programming. It was developed by an old friend and boss of mine, Charles Samuni. Are they at all related? Um, well, first of all, he works for Microsoft, right? Um, look, he's, this is a canonical example of somebody trying to do factorial and Fibonacci. The examples of intentional programming is let's do transformations. He, I mean, the fundamental point is different. He's trying to come with a clever idea and apply it downwards. The idea of generic programming, you do not come with a clever idea. You go and catch rabbits. You go study algorithms and other people's codes. I mean, if you want to do generic programming for Adobe Illustrator, you don't try to rethink it top down. You should go and look at the code. So this, this is the fundamental, it's methodological difference. Okay? And as a result, for example, what he does, this is, you know, he truly says that, do you remember what Fibonacci numbers are? Right? So in Simonius, Simonius, uh, canonical talk, he spends a lot of time showing you that if you have recursive def definition of Fibonacci numbers, which of course is going to be terribly inefficient because you know, you f Fib of n is going to call Fib of n minus 1 and Fib of n minus 2 and therefore it sort of explodes exponentially, really exponentially. He shows you that you could come up with a very, very clever way to produce non-exponential linear version of Fibonacci. Well, two points. First of all, a first-year sophomore, I mean, whatever, freshman in college should be able to write iterative Fibonacci numbers, which are linear time. You just start from zero and compute till you come to that point. It's one line of code, but there's more profound point. 
You see, if you really want to compute Fibonacci, you have to realize there's log n procedure for computing n Fibonacci number. As a matter of fact, there is a remarkable result by Chuck Fiducia, which tells you that any linear recurrence, Fibonacci is an example of linear recurrence. Linear recurrence is something which, which tells the element number n is a linear function of k previous values of n minus 1, n minus, sub minus 2, and so on, right? That could be done in logarithmic time. And it's based, believe it or not, on what is known as Russian peasant algorithm. Russian peasant algorithm is an algorithm for doing exponentiation, for raising a to the nth power. Do you realize that you could raise a to the nth power in log n steps? Order of log n, potentially almost two log n steps. But log n steps, eh? It's in CNUS, right? Or it's, it is in STL now, but uh, at least an SGI version. So uh, the, you, you, know, you could do that. Now observe the amazing fact. If you take a matrix, one, one, zero, one, two by two matrix, what does it do if you multiply a vector by it? It gives you a vector where the first element is the sum of this element, of both elements, and the second element is the second. It sort of, sh it does Fibonacci transformation. So to get nth Fibonacci number, you need to take vector 1, 1, the first two Fibonacci numbers, and multiply it by this matrix raised to nth power. Matrix multiplication is associative. Therefore, you could do it in log n steps. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, it's, it's a little tricky, but I suspect any of you s could do it at home with, with, with the paper, right? So. This is not, this is not top-down. You couldn't have figured out from the first principle, like memorization, let's, let's save intermediate memory things. This is going and reading algorithms books, and some, some particular paper by Chuck Fiducia who discovered that. Right? So th the answer is you have to look, I mean, this is fundamental methodological difference. Again, I, you know, I advocate that you do not, I mean, you do not, do to, uh, top down never works because let's let's assume that you design an airplane by top down method you say it's very simple we'll have a lifting device landing device and horizontal moving device <laughs> this top down will allocate this group to do you know lifting device this group will do landing device and the guys in the back will do horizontal top down i mean logic i mean flow chart i mean management will be quite happy it's never going to fly, because you actually have to figure out some fundamental physical laws on which it's based, which, which are not, again, the, the problem, genetic programming gives you impression which it comes from the top, because of the word genetic, right? But it's fundamentally, it's as bottom up as possible. You have to go and find, you know, what is available, what, what is there. And then you abstract and systematize it. But you do not, you do not come with, with this. It's again, if you remember before Simone time, the great speech by John Beckers, some of you might have remember, could programming be liberated from von Neumann's style? My friend Larry, of course, remembers that, which shocked all of us. It was such, he said, we will have five functional forms, and we will compose all programs from five functional forms. No, you couldn't compose all programs of fun functional forms. I'm not telling you that STL has all the algorithms. I'm saying it has a set of useful algorithms. But there are more of them to be discovered. It's an infinite process of discovery. There are other data structures. You cannot, I mean, you know, this is, this is the wonderful nature of you know, the universe. There are other things to discover. Again, notice that I don't say invent. Uh, you know, I actually do believe algorithm and data structures have this platonic existence that binary search existed even before whomever <laughs> invented it. I mean, it was there. I mean, it's very funny. It's like natural numbers, you see. They are of the same reality as natural numbers. And we have to discover them, but it's, it is, you know, you go find them and then abstract them. Well, you ask a simple question, I go for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> 
I wonder if the, any of the people on the phone or the video bridge have questions. Just ask. Got another one. So looking back uh, 20 years where we were then and, and, and where you thought we'd be now and, and looking from this point back and forward, do you, have we made decent progress? Do you think we're going to continue if we had? Yes, we have. You see, that we made much less of a progress than we wanted then. Sort of, we want instantaneous progress. You see, the, the, the sad reality of it that, you know, life is short. I want the problem to be solved now because, you know, it's not too many years I have left to, to hang around. And see, I cannot wait 100 years. But yes, there is progress. And it's not just STL. I mean, you know, there are, you know, there are my, I mean, you know, Bjarna. And in some, let me, let me now, I told you all kind of bad things about C++, why it doesn't do that, doesn't do that. Now let me tell you why I think Bjarna is a great person. Absolutely great. Unlike, you know, I know many other language designers, and some of them may be able to design a nicer, cleaner language than Bjarna. I know Niklaus Wirt. He's a wonderful language designer, no quite the guy who designed Pascal and Oberon. He, he's, he's a brilliant language designer. What he, what he does is that he designs one language, say, called Euclid. Then he drops, designs another language called LWW, and designs a third language called Pascal. He starts from scratch because he understands that this is not quite right. Let's throw away. Right? Then he designs Oberon, then he. Or modular, modular two, Oberon, right? He starts from. There is one person I know in the entire computer science, I don't know anybody else like that, who started in 1978 working on a language. He has been cranking and improving and improving and adding things. You know, object oriented, doesn't quite work, template, doesn't work, I mean, you know. So it's a remarkable example of progress. And one book which I highly recommend that you read, there's no other book in computer science like that, is Bjarne's book, Design and Evolution of C++. Why? Because there is a man who explains to you how some very major activity took place over 20 years. And nobody, I mean, in many respects, Dennis is, I don't want to say more brilliant than Bjarne, but you know, C is a marvel, such a remarkable language. It was designed in three months. I mean, clearly, Dennis is genius. But what he did, he designed this language, washed his hands, and he's done. He, he doesn't want to meddle with it. Bjarne is much slower. He doesn't do these brilliant things in three months. But now it's 25 years, right? So we have this. And it is better. I mean, it is better. We could do more things, right? So, yes, we do see progress. There are some tools which were not there before. We understand more about computation. So certain feds died out. We don't try to do logic programming anymore. You know, we, we tried, we, we learned. Yes, there is progress, but it's, you see, we all want, in, <laughs> this, is, this is the tension. You know, all of us want immediate solutions. And there is a slow, painful, gradual, collective process where all of us contribute, and literally all of us. I mean, one thing which I learned uh, is that, you know, it is a collective process in many respects, because STL contains ideas from all kinds of sources. You know, I, I cannot directly say that what Larry contributed to STL, I didn't know him at that time frame, but I'm sure he did. This is not, I mean, you know, any, any person of his generation, some of the idea crept in. I, I stole from somebody who stole from, from Larry. I mean, there is this collective, collective learning. I don't know how, how, how to explain. So, you know, we, we learn. And, you know, when you do something, you tell, tell what you do. I mean, it's one important thing. And I have to, you know, acknowledge Tom, him being an important executive here. Let them publish. Because if they do something good and it's not recorded, it's dead. It's, it's sort of unpublished stuff. It's one of the tragedies which I have. I, I'm terrible in recording my work. And looking back, so much stuff which, which I really think very, very important, it's just gone. It's dead. It's no more. It never existed. 
because it was never put in, in the form where people, people could use it. So, you know, it's very important that people have an opportunity. If you write, again, you know, I wish every one of you, those of you who write code, would write at least one function which will stay forever. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Because then this collective wisdom will grow. I mean, I'm not saying that you have to, to write 77,000 lines of code. 10 lines. If every working programmer produces 10 lines of code which truly becomes this part of the collective history, then we will grow. This is where you know, finding this mechanism, and it's not hard. I mean, you know, I am positive that every programmer can. The mechanism, and I do not know how to come up with it. And it's not even money. I'm sure, you know, most of you would like to, right? If, if you had a chance. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm saying something. Yeah? But there is no easy mechanism. It's not that your boss wouldn't let you. Ten lines, he would. I mean, it's not, but, you know, it's, it's, there is no easy mechanism. We do not know such a mechanism for, for, do, for doing it. And uh, uh, one, one problem is that, you know, at least this is when I sort of compare uh, myself with uh, Linus. Uh, he's a far greater, like three orders of magnitude organizer than I am. He, he created this structure where people contribute code. It's very often awful code, but it's, it's another point altogether. I mean, his organizational skills, which are very great, again, you know, part of what you do as a scientist or whatever, is you have to create this infrastructure, otherwise things disappear. He was able to do it brilliantly. You know, I somehow never was able to, you know, go beyond a very small group of people. Not, you know, I don't know, I mean, just never could. Uh, I could name, I mean, all the major contributors to STL, you know, I could name, and you know, basically they're people with whom I worked. I mean, you know, as, well, as Matt Austin writes in the introduction to his book, almost everything I know about generic programming, Alex taught me. Sadly enough, this is true. That is, right now, it's this sort of people who, either me or people whom I taught, if you like, this is not good enough. So, uh, just answering, you know, what could, if we could, we need mechanisms for accumulating components, <laughs> pieces, knowledge. Because a lot of stuff, even I'm sure within Adobe, I don't think there's a f flow of knowledge from project to project, or from programmer to programmer. I mean, you know, there's people, people keep redoing the same, I mean, Am I? Maybe Adobe is different from any other place. But uh, you're trying? Is it working? Oh, good, good. Well, maybe you should invite me and you should give me a talk about how you do that. I would like to know. I mean, it's, it's interesting. But usually it doesn't. I mean, the, the sort of problems with information, information flow. So, yes, it's, you know. A long, it's a long thing, so it's not total failure, it's not total success. It's, you know, we muddle through. This is, I think, typical human thing. You know, every endeavor we muddle through, you know, somehow. And it's never going to be perfect. And it's nobody's, I mean, you know, it's nobody's fault. I mean, it's not there's a government conspiracy, you know, or you know, bad professors, or, you know, it's just, it's hard. But hopefully, you know, we'll see more progress. So if there are uh, no further questions, then I would like to thank Alex very much for his... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, perhaps we could convince him to stay if people want to come and talk yeah. privately.